Good morning and uh, welcome this morning to Cross Memorial. A uh, very special welcome to our visitors and uh, also to those who are online. Um, if you, for the visitors, if you'd like more information about Christ Memorial, uh, we have a visitor center in our narthex back there after the service. Um, you can do that. Um, we will be celebrating Holy Communion today and um, just ask the visitors to read uh, our statement of beliefs. I believe the pastor will also say something uh, during the, or just before the communion. Um, to members and visitors alike, please fill out the uh, We Care card. Visitors looks like this. The uh, members have a white one. It's located in the uh, pew in front of you. Uh, a couple of announcements this morning. Um, the uh, Christmas tree will be put up uh, November 27th at 10 a.m. If you can help out. Your, your help would be greatly appreciated. Um, also, they are uh, selling poinsettias for the altar at Christmas. And if you're interested in purchasing poinsettias to beautify our sanctuary, uh, please sign up by December 12th using the altar flower sign-up book that is in the back in the narthex. Uh, Pastor, I think you had uh, one announcement you wanted Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see you again. Welcome to Christ Memorial. For those of you who don't know me, whether you're online or here in person, I am Pastor Tyler, lead pastor here at Christ Memorial. Uh, just a note of clarification on the poinsettias because it's a little confusing this year. Uh, we do have this flyer that's back in the back in the narthex. This is a fundraiser for the school. This would be like personal poinsettias. Like if you're going to have some poinsettias at your house, uh, this would be what that is for. And th that is due by November 19th. So that is a separate poinsettia thing um, that it's happening. Uh, if you're looking to get them for the altar area for the Christmas season, uh, that'll be in the, the flower book that's on the right hand side from where I'm looking in the narthex. So just a little bit of confusion there. Uh, but this one is a fundraiser for the school. All right. Um, in addition, we have a women's Bible study happening this coming Tuesday. We also have another women's uh, care group. It's really, it's another Bible study, another time for, for women to get together. Um, that is going to be happening regularly as well. Check your happenings for more information on that. We also have retired older Christian kids. They're having a dinner and get together on December 7th. So that's something that's coming up. We have a lot of stuff going on here at Christ Memorial, and I would encourage you to find a way to get involved beyond just this one hour, sometimes an hour and 15, depending on how long my sermon goes. Uh, but beyond just this one hour on Sunday morning, there are tons of ways to get involved. So find a way to get actively involved here. With that being said, let's go ahead and stand for our opening hymn today, hymn number 912, Christ is Our Cornerstone.
we call upon the presence of God in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who Amen. made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought and word and in deed and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. We pause for a moment of personal, private prayer and confession. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins as a called and ordained servant of Christ. And by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now continue in worship with the service of the word, reading responsibly, Psalm 16. We will read it responsibly by verse. Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night. Also, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness and joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. O oh Lord, by your bountiful goodness, Release us from the bonds of our sins, which by reason of our weakness we have brought upon ourselves, that we may stand firm until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Today's first reading is from Daniel, chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, and can be found on page 750 of your pew Bible. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is from Acts chapter 4, verses 15, uh, sorry, 5 to 14. 
can be found on page 912 of your pew Bible. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing before, beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. This is the word of the Lord. Oh, God. 
Let's go ahead and stand as we read the gospel reading. Today's gospel reading comes to us, that famous verse beginning John 3, 16 through John 3, 21. It can be found on page 888 of your pew Bible if you want to follow along. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We now profess our faith together through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We continue now with our sermon hymn, which is found as an insert within your bulletin, uh, one of my personal favorite hymns, and it ties nicely into today's sermon, In Christ Alone.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, special welcome to those of you watching online. If you are watching just the sermon, I know sometimes you can go on YouTube and just watch the sermon or even just skip ahead as you watch later on. I got to tell you, you're missing out because the song that we just sang, one of my personal favorites, In Christ Alone, I'll be referencing it a number of times during the sermon. Uh, so I would encourage you to go back and watch that as well. All of our services are available online for everybody here in the room if you want to go back and watch those as well. Well, part of the reason In Christ Alone is so powerful to me is I remember as a kid going to the National Youth Gathering and the LCMS, and uh, I wasn't a particularly religious teenager, but man, sitting in a stadium and seeing 20, 25,000 other high schoolers singing In Christ Alone together, it just brought chills. It was, it was life-changing, to be completely honest. It is a powerful, powerful song. And so today, as we continue on with our sermon series, looking at the solas, looking at that foundational tenet of Lutheran faith, and we got to solus Christus, in Christ alone, man, this is one that is near and dear to my heart, and I hope that I'm able to, to do it justice, at least a little bit. But before we go into that, if you could join me in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you today and we thank you. We thank you for the chance that we get to worship you, to come together here in this room or online, that we live in an age where technology is available, that we can still worship even from the comfort of our living room for whatever reason, Lord, but you also call us into community. So I thank you for this chance that we get to come together. Lord, I thank you for the chance to share your message. It is your message, Lord. And so I submit myself to you. I pray that your Holy Spirit is at work in me and through me, and I pray that all who hear this will be bold enough to do the same, to submit themselves to your Holy Spirit, to be at work in a real and powerful way. Speak in this way, Lord. Proclaim your love and your gospel. In your name we pray. Amen. Again, we are going through a sermon series on the solas. It's a little refresher. Uh, after we went through a series looking at the seven deadly sins, a traditionally Catholic idea, I figured let's bring some Lutheranism in. And the solas are kind of that foundational idea of what it means to be a Lutheran. In fact, that was a, a big thrust of my message last week, which if you missed any of that, I would encourage you, go back and watch that. I think it defines us when it comes to being Lutheran. It's not about... The, the traditions we have or the style we have, it's about what we believe. Now, the solas, uh, there are three kind of foundational ones and then two extras that kind of tag along with it. Those first three are sola scriptura, sola gratia, sola fide, and then the two extra you often find will be solus Christus, in Christ alone, and soli Deo Gloria. Basically what that's saying is we believe in Scripture, we believe in grace and faith, we believe in Christ, and we believe that everything goes back to God. Now I find myself perhaps wondering, as maybe you are, why do we have these two extra? Why were they not part of the original three solas? Why are they not that foundational idea? And I think part of it is if you go back to the reformers, like the people back in the, the 1500s that were looking at the church, which eventually became the Catholic church, but at the time was just the church, they saw some, some issues that need to be addressed. And those issues really corresponded with those first three. It was an issue of, of where do we get our faith? Where do we get our understanding of God? It comes from, from scripture, right? How do we earn salvation when we don't? It's by grace. And then what is it that delivers that grace to us? Our faith through the Holy Spirit. Those were the three things that were very fundamental when it comes to addressing the issues of the church at the time. Now, this idea of in Christ alone, it doesn't mean that they believe it any less. It doesn't mean as they looked at the concept of in Christ alone that that, that wasn't important to them. And to define kind of what they're getting at probably is it's a matter of salvation, right? Our salvation comes through Christ, through the Son of God, his perfect life, and his willing sacrifice. That is what gets us salvation, right? But looking at those reformers, that wasn't really the big issue. Remember the context where they're living, um, there wasn't a ton of diversity, at least in terms of diversity of thought. Like there certainly was, but not a ton uh, in that, that 15th century Germany and, and Europe area. Right? And, and so when it comes to faith in Christ, they're going up against the Catholic church, the church, that still is Christian. 
right? The question of in Christ alone isn't really one that's in question. Uh, even today, Catholics, while there may be some disagreements there, they are Christian. They believe that Christ is their Lord and Savior, and thus they will be in heaven with us one day. But for the Reformers, it wasn't such a hot-button issue. However, in 2021 in America, well, we live in a slightly different context. We live in a context where we have uh, global information, where you can connect with somebody who lives in China or Russia or Cuba or, or Brazil or Mexico or anywhere across the world, even somewhere as far away as Dallas. I know. And so there's this idea that there are these different faiths, these different understandings, these different beliefs, especially here in Houston, the most diverse city in the United States. Yes, more diverse than New York. And so we look around and we see all these different thoughts, all these different religions, all these different ethnicities and backgrounds, and the concept of in Christ alone becomes a little bit more crucial. Because I've told this story before, but when I was working as a server at a restaurant in St. Louis, uh, one of my coworkers was telling me, oh, you're studying to become a pastor. Okay, I believe in some of the things from Christianity. I was like, oh, what do you mean some of the things from Christianity? He said, well, I, I borrow a little bit from here and a little bit from there. And I've got, I've got some of the, the ideas of Buddhist philosophy and, and a little bit of some of the Jewish morality. And I said, oh, okay, so you've created your own religion. He said, no, 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 no. I'm a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And I said, right, but of the, the billions of people on this planet, you're the only one that has that particular set of beliefs that all come together. And he's like, I never really thought about that. I said, you've essentially created your own religion. With that in mind, quite frankly, we could have 7.7 .7 billion different religions on this planet. Because even though we all kind of sit here within a Lutheran church, Missouri Synod, I'm going to bet that there are certain little bits that we disagree on. There are certain little things that we have different understandings and different nuances on, but that's why in Christ alone is so important. Because when it comes down to the big question of salvation, when it comes down to the big question of eternity, it comes down to Jesus and Jesus alone. All the other stuff is peripheral. All the other stuff is just understanding more about God and his people, right? This world. But it all ties back to Christ. It comes back to the idea of salvation in Christ alone. We see that in our epistle reading, right? Uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 12. It says, salvation in no one else, for there is no other name given among men by which you might be saved. No other name, not Moses, not Muhammad, not Buddha, not the Apostle Paul, not Oprah, not Donald, not Joe, not Jim or Tim or Margaret or whatever your name is, not you, not Tyler. No other name that is given among man will save. And yet we seek it so much so often we strive after the approval of the things of this world. We try and base our lives on the voice and the opinion of the people around us. There is no other name by which we are saved but Jesus and Jesus alone, who came to this earth and lived a perfect life and then died a sacrificial death so that we can be set free. This matters. And it matters in a big way. Maybe you're thinking, okay, well, what about the people of the Jewish and, and the, the Muslims? And what about, because they kind of have the same God, kind of, right? Okay, you could say, yes, there is a similar origin. They understand the kind of the creation of God. You could say, uh, you look at Jewish and they, they would look at the, the Old Testament. We consider the Old Testament. They don't call it that. Um, but they consider that to be God's word. But they, they stop short when it comes to the Messiah. They recognize that God has promised a savior. God has promised a Messiah. God has said somebody is going to come save them, but then when presented with Jesus, they go, yeah, but not him. Despite all the prophecies being fulfilled, despite him following through on so many things that were said centuries earlier, they go, mm, nah, but he was a good teacher, but, but not him. And, and Muslims, they, they left a little earlier even than that. Uh, Abraham, right? With Abraham, they kind of split off and did their own thing. So while they probably have an understanding of a creator God, the same creator God that we have, right? We would consider that to be God the Father. 
they lose the full identity of who God is. We recognize that we have a triune God, often called the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and three persons, and yet one God. They come together. They have different jobs, different roles, and yet they are one. That is God's true and full identity. And to just focus on the Creator means you're missing out on the Savior, means you're missing out on the Holy Spirit, which inspires our faith, even as at work right now, in this moment. And by not understanding the full identity of God, they're falling short of knowing God, really. It's like when your kid's little and they only see you as mom and they don't realize that, that you're a talented musician and that you, you got a business degree and that you had a life before that kid. All you are to him is the person that can open his go-gurt, right? He doesn't fully understand who you are. He doesn't understand you, right? And so that understanding of who you are, the understanding of who God is in completeness, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Savior, God saves. All of God saves. And so in Christ alone matters. It is through Jesus alone that we are saved. Now, when it comes to the reformers, that would be the end of the topic. But we live in a modern age, and I think there are some extra things that we can glean from this idea of in Christ alone. And looking at the song that we just sang, In Christ Alone, there's one particular line, kind of a couplet, that, that's there in the first verse that really stands out to me. It says this, What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. Let's focus in on, on one little phrase there, when fears are stilled. What does that mean? What are we afraid of? What fears do we have that are stilled by Christ alone, by this love, this height of love, this depth of peace? See, let me explain. In our modern age, we have a problem with mortality. <laughs> In that, we don't have a problem with mortality. Th that is to say, um, when you look at, at death, in ancient times, it was around all the time. You saw death. It was a very real part of society and life. And thus, faith and the question of the afterlife was a very real part of life. But in our current age, really over the past hundred years, that has become less and less and less prevalent. You can talk to somebody who is 15, 20 years old, and perhaps they don't even know a single person close to them who has died. That's why, quite frankly, if you look at the demographics of church, it's getting older and older and older because there's an exposure to mortality. It's why, as a pastor, when it comes to funerals, I know that I can hit that gospel hard and people will hear it. It's like this. A hundred years ago, life was very different. Betty White turns a hundred this year. When Betty White was born, her life expectancy was basically half of how long she's lived. Back in 1920, the life expectancy was 53 years old. Now, 100 years later, it's like almost 30 years more. Now the life expectancy is about 79 years old. And we know that, of course, we, many extend well beyond that. And so when your life expectancy is 80 plus, what does that matter to a 20-year-old? As somebody who's 15 and trying to figure out, and their brains forming, and they're asking questions about faith. What does faith matter to somebody that mortality isn't an issue? See, we struggle with this because it's so far off in the distance that we don't need to think about supernatural things. We can focus on this world. I'm reminded I was watching a show, and, uh, and in it, there's a little boy, he's turning five, and he asks his dad, Dad, am I going to die? And the dad says, well, I mean, honestly, not for a long time, because, you know, like right now, people are living a 90, 100, and, and you're just little, and so by the time you get older, who knows what kind of advances there'll be in medicine. You could live to be, be 200. And then it cuts to the next scene, and the kid's up on, on the banister of the second floor holding an umbrella, about to jump off, and the mom's like, what are you doing? He's like, I just learned I can't die. <laughs> and then the mom says, no, 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 you, you, you're crazy. No, people die all the time. Yeah, we hope that it's not for a long time, but like, Silly things happen like a coconut falls on somebody's head and they might die just then. You never know when you might die. And the kid's face gets like, 
And it's at that moment that all the birthday party kids show up and it cuts to the next scene and here's a bunch of five-year-olds sitting around having an existential crisis because they've just learned that they could die any moment now. We really need to thread the needle on that. <laughs> we need to find a way to be there in the middle when it comes to this understanding of mortality. Because here's the reality. Every single one of us will die. Our time on this earth is limited. And so we have to ask the question, what will happen to me when I die? Not to my stuff, because we have wills for that, right? That's something that, that's in the mind of anybody. It's, it's crazy. The people are willing to think about their will, where their stuff goes, but not about themselves. Not about the intricate personality and person that they are. Not about their soul. They'll think about their legacy, what kind of story they're leaving behind, but not about who they are. What about what happens to us when we die? And as we start to address that idea of mortality, it can be frightening. It can be terrifying. It can be something that, that leaves you awake, tossing and turning at night, thinking, what's going to happen to me? This is, this is something that I'm afraid of. And that is where in our song we hear when fears are stilled because we have a God who has overcome death. Because we know that the worst thing that this world can throw at us, which is death, it's already been defeated. We know that death just sets us free from this suffering, sets us free from the pain and the mourning of this world, gets to be in paradise with God Almighty, where we can have a reunion with all those who have gone before us. That sounds amazing to me where fears are stilled in Christ alone. Because when you start to ask that question of what's going to happen to me when I die, then you start to explore other religions. And my friends, I would challenge you to find a religion that has the same free grace that Christianity does. To have a God who gives a free gift of salvation. It's not about us earning it. It's not about living a good life. It's not about yin-yang. It's not about karma. It's not about this. It's about God doing it for us. That's why last week's sermon mattered. Grace alone and faith alone. Because we've been set free. And that is what helps those fears to be stilled. In Christ alone. But then as we live in this world, there is another thing that we can interpret this idea of in Christ alone with. And that's the question of, who am I? What gives me worth? What gives me value? Why am I worth anything? That's the primary conflict between man and woman in marriage, is the man wants to know, am I good enough? And the woman wants to know, am I loved enough? It's the same question, really. And that question, we try and fill so many different ways. We try and find our value. We try and find love. We try and find our worth in so many ways that this world will throw at us. Maybe it's your job. You spend all your hours working or thinking about working or you've retired and you're looking back and saying, boy, that was a lot better when I had a purpose back then. Maybe it's your family. Maybe it's making sure that, that your kids or your grandkids are taken care of to the utmost, that they are spoiled, rotten, because that is what gives you value. But then what happens when that relationship starts to create distance and you find yourself hurting, you find yourself wondering, what have I done wrong? What's wrong with me? Do I have any worth? Maybe it's your bank account keeping that, that number as high as possible. Maybe it's your status. Maybe it's your reputation. Maybe it's being the best church member that you can be and being on every board that you can. None of those things will fulfill you. None of those things will be able to fill you up. In fact, what we do is we pour ourselves into all these imperfect vessels. We pour our time and our energy, our talent, our treasures into so many things and they're imperfect, which means you have to leave part of yourself out. Anyone who's been around a workaholic knows that they often will put their family to the side. They'll miss recitals, they'll miss birthdays, they'll miss the various things because you gotta focus and I'm trying to earn the bread, honey. I'm try, trying to make a living here. This is my responsibility and work. 
Or maybe it's, you know, your family and you have to put your dreams and your talents to the side. Yeah, you're a talented musician, but I don't ever get to practice anymore. See, when you're pouring into an imperfect vessel, you have to leave something behind. But we have a perfect vessel, and that is God who gave you those talents, who gave you those passions, who gave you your unique personality, who looks at you, sees everything about you that you so desperately wish people would know. He knows. And then, on the other side of that, all those things that you so desperately hope that nobody ever finds out about, he knows about that too. And he still loves you. He still will take every ounce of you. He still will take everything of you and know you and love you and say, you are my beloved child worthy of my own life and sacrifice in Christ alone. If we seek to find our identity in our God who knows us and loves us, if we seek to find our worth and our value, not in the job that one day we may get laid off, not in the family that may have fractures in relationships, not in your bank account, which is reliant on who knows what, but instead in the one true God who will never fade away, who will never turn his back on you, whose love is unchanging and unconditional, that's where we find our worth. So as you go out this week, as you go about your life, I want you to ask yourself some questions. Who am I? What gives me worth? It's in the fact that you are a beloved child of God, made in his hand, made in his likeness, made to be his masterpiece. He knows you. Who am I? What kind of life do I want to live? A life that that pursues the things of this world, that that tries to stack up treasure in a place that that rusts and moth destroy, or in a place of heaven? Is your legacy going to be one of faith? Ask yourself, what am I afraid of? What's holding me back? What's stopping me from being bold and proclaiming my faith of living my life, of, of trusting that God has this all under control? And then the last question Why? Why does any of this matter? Because we have a God who is over all things. It's not just church. It's not just coming in here and singing some songs and and this is great, having a potluck. No, we have a God who rules over the entire cosmos and he knows you and he cares about you enough to offer you salvation from yourself from this world that is broken, that's constantly whispering lies in your ears and into your heart, whispering that sweet nothing of, no, 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 if you just follow this, it'll be enough, and it never is enough. Where do you find your hope? Where do you find your love? Where do you find your trust? In Christ alone. Amen? Amen. Now, if you'll join me in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you today and we ask that you would help us to let go of the shackles of this world, the slavery to sin, the slavery to brokenness, the slavery to the lies around us. Lord, help us to see the power of having a Savior that sets us free. God, help us to live lives boldly, knowing that we've been forgiven, knowing that we've been given a new life through nothing that we do. We don't earn it, Lord, but instead you give it to us freely by your grace. Help us to proclaim that because there are so many who desperately need to hear that, who are just ignoring the question of mortality, who are living their lives in darkness because they're afraid of the light. Help us to show them that the light helps, the light heals, the light offers hope. Strengthen us, Lord, to be bold enough to live by faith. And Lord, it is all not in us, but in Christ alone. And Lord, because we live in this broken world, there are those who need prayers because of physical needs, bodily needs, emotional and spiritual needs. And so we raise them up here now. We pray especially for Austin and Rosemary and Harlan, for Wanda and Skip and Bill, for Klaus and for Donna, for Bruce who celebrates a birthday today. We pray for Jennifer, for Don, for Mike, for Norma and Carolyn, for Joanne and Kristen, for John and Ruth and Bill, for Atlas, for Posey 
and Merrill and from Monique and from Melody. Lord, you know what's going on in their lives as they go through various issues of this broken world. But we pray, Lord, that you would ease their pain physically, emotionally, and even spiritually. Lord, let your church break through those doors and proclaim the gospel in a way that delivers freedom from fear. Lord, help our strivings to cease, to know that, that just as you work through the apostles, just ordinary, everyday people, you can work through us to deliver hope in the gospel. Lord, strengthen our faith that we may live boldly. And Lord, because we live in this broken world, there's so many prayers that I can't extend. I can't pray for all the lives that are here or online, but Lord, you taught us a prayer. And so here now in this place with one voice, one family of believers, we pray that very same prayer, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We're going to continue now in worship by gathering the gifts that God has put into our care that we can then turn back to him. This is an act of faith. This is an act of generosity. This is an act of understanding that first fruits mean that you're trusting that there will be second fruits. And so as we give, we do so not for a pat on the back or to, to buy our salvation or anything, but instead out of gratitude and out of faith, out of generosity. And we trust that God will continue to provide for us. Uh, those of you joining online, we, we can't pass you the plate or anything. There is a way to give online on our website, or you can text to give as well. Uh, after the offering, we're going to move into the sacrament of the altar, something that God delivers his presence, his grace to us, and we can't share that with you. Uh, we would encourage you to find a local church where you can share in this moment, in this miracle. But in the meantime, we pray that you have a blessed day, a blessed week, and that you know that God is with you no matter what. We continue now in worship.